blessings to you this evening, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. All right, so for the last, uh, how many, 15 weeks, we've been doing a discernment series on uh, looking at various preachers and uh, famous people in the world uh, to make discernment about them. We want to be like Sherlock Holmes. We want to be able to investigate everything, look into it and test it and see if it is right and true and good according to the rule and norm of all of our doctrines and faith, which is God's canonical scriptures, the 66 books of the Old and the New Testament. That's the confession of our church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. This is the sole norm and rule for judging all faith and doctrine. If uh, there be anything that is taught by any teacher, be he famous or of uh, obscurity, uh, it's all to be tested according to this. Uh, and if it is according to the book, we rejoice, we receive it. If it's not according to this book, we need to reject it. That doesn't mean we reject everything about the person or something, but we need to reject at least that doctrine. We need to always keep ourselves safe. So, are you good Sherlock Holmes investigators of all things? Because the scriptures teach this. This is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. The Holy Spirit teaches us. It says, Take heed to the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. And here, test everything, like Sherlock Holmes. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Because we're on a great journey. We are pilgrims and pilgrims progress on our way to the celestial city, the great gates of our king. And Jesus says the way there is hard and it is a narrow path. And there are many byways that butt down upon it, upon the path that can go off in various directions. Do you think this girl can walk in any direction and be safe? What if she were to close her eyes and just say, I'll walk the rest of this journey uh, with my eyes closed. Or if night falls upon her and it's complete pitch darkness and the, the path is level, and yet there's a 200-foot cliff or a 300-foot cliff right next door, and the next step could be our last. So what I wanted to do tonight, as I'd like to pick up with the book of Daniel next week, is to just recap what we've done over the last 15 weeks or so, and, uh, and just get the takeaways from it. So we can just, like uh, Ruth going about the edges of the field, just pick up the gleanings because we've, we've been spending a lot of time diving into each of these teachers. We've been dissecting them. We've been trying to be detectives and, and look carefully at them. And we've tried to look at the good and the bad uh, with each of them. We're not throwing out everything. We're just trying to give them a little praise where it's due, if there can even be such a thing in some cases, and in other cases uh, to, to see what we would not go with. So Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress. Remember, that was a difficult journey, and uh, he had to keep his eyes about him. The first person we looked at when we looked at this was Billy Graham. Remember? What is my takeaway from Billy Graham when we looked at him? When we see him early on, he was on fire for the Lord, and he was, for the most part, I mean, for the most part, preaching this book very clearly and rightly. I mean, you might not be able to find everything perfect, but he was on fire, and he's preaching Jesus is the narrow way, Salvation only in Jesus Christ, justification by faith in him, and with all power and zeal. What happened to him as he got older? He changed. You see, there was a, uh, a friend of his that said, Oh, you know, Billy, you're preaching the Bible because you believe it's inerrant and infallible, without error and fully trustworthy. Let me give you a little enlightenment here. And they introduced him to what's called historical criticism, which is a different view of the Bible, a wrong view of the Bible born of the, uh, quote, Enlightenment days. Uh, unfortunately, it started in Germany and other places um, where they began to question the Bible. Did God really say? And he came to ultimately hold the Bible pretty lightly. And we saw in that interview up here, he's saying, you must believe in Jesus. It's the only name by which you can be saved. Here he says, you don't even need to know Jesus' name. You can be saved. Follow whatever light you have. So what's the takeaway I have for that one is it's a slippery slope, the historical critical approach to the Bible. Beware of, as you get older, 
be more conservative rather than less so. Be more biblical and Christian and not stray. Uh, be not like Solomon, who started great, wrote a lot of the Bible, and fell away at the end of his life through the suggestion of his wives, but rather be like, well, <laughs> you could be like Manasseh, who started out really evil, and he was restored and became zealous for the Lord late in life. Better than both of those, start out great and end great, even better. But anyway, just beware as we get older, when you retire from your job, don't retire from Christianity. We need to be all the more vigilant and alert, especially in these days as we get older, that we not be deceived and led away. The rise of liberalism and apostasy. So this exact topic, we, well, we didn't cover it exactly that way, but we covered some people from that ilk and from the modernist um, uh, side. So this is in the early 1900s. The fundamentalists believed in the fundamentals of the Bible. God's word, Christ alone, his physical resurrection, his virgin birth. The modernists questioned all of those things. And that's what's grown up inside the church, or at least visible Christendom. The great descent towards of the modernists is, uh, I forget that what it is, Bible's not infallible, man's not made in God's image, there's no such thing as miracles, no virgin birth, no deity of Christ, no atonement, no physical resurrection, agnosticism, atheism. And so what did we see from that group? We looked at this lady. Remember the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church? This is from about in the 2005-ish era. Catherine Jeffords Scorey. What did we note about her? She was a false teacher, unfortunately. She was a wolf in sheep's clothing because she was asked about, remember marriage, and she was asked about, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Remember how she danced around that question? Yeah. So my takeaway from this one is, if someone wears a clerical collar, don't trust them, go on high alert. <laughs> okay, that doesn't mean you can't trust them, but go on high alert to check them out very diligently because they might be of this group. Also notice she was very silver tongued. She was not flustered by difficult questions. Um, so they are very great talkers, these. But we all gotta go again back. Is she giving a straight answer to a straight question? She did not. We had to reject her. And of course, here she is, she's promoting the whole LGBTQ1A plus stuff. And the Episcopal Church welcomes you, but you can see the rust stains. That was my original church. I was originally Episcopalian. Loved it when I was younger, but it's over the years departed for the faith, sort of like Billy Graham in its older age. We looked at the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which are the other Lutherans, were the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, who holds to the biblical uh, confession of our forefathers. The ELCA Lutherans, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, has been like the Episcopal Church and going the way of the modernists. I went to their seminary, remember? for a time, and they teach the historical critical approach to the Bible versus what we believe, which is something called historical, historical well, grammatical approach. Namely, it's true. <laughs> Their belief now, it's full of errors, is in short. We looked at this lady, uh, Bishop Eaton, although she, was, she had a different haircut. This one's a little more butch because she is, uh, you know, promoting what they promote these days, but... Um, Again, she's a good talker, talks about love, and we agree with love, of course. Talks about tolerance, we agree with tolerance, but then the way she spins it, and this was the Episcopal Church, uh, sorry, the uh, ELCA Church, remember, we looked at in 2009 when they voted at their National Assembly to promote and, and have uh, homosexual practicing men and women as their pastors and preachers and bishops and presiding bishops. So they completely went that route. Remember what happened? Is at that convention, we watched actually the actual video of the tornado that formed right over their convention center, came down and smote, smote the building. Remember the, uh, this, this was the, right across the street from their convention center, that's what it looked like before, and the cross was knocked off afterwards that had been there for 90 years and fell at two o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday in August 2009, exactly at the moment when that topic came up at their convention. Is God still keeping his eye upon the things of the world? He is, he is carefully watching everything. Don't think that God is disinterested because 
You don't see him always acting like this. At times he shows his hand like this, and certainly he's shown his hand in the scriptures. So let's be on guard against that kind of thing. We did see people, we also watched videos of people standing up against that uh, at that convention, remember? The guy outside that was preaching the gospel, calling his own denomination, repent, don't go this wicked way that you're choosing. But they laughed at him and sent the security to have him removed. God says in Revelation, come out from her. In other words, the apostate church, my people. Lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So what is God, the takeaway for that is, you know, not everything that looks like church is to be trusted. Okay, in fact, uh, we're to test everything. Test me. Test everything and see, am I giving you this word or not? And every true preacher should be happy to be tested and should encourage it. We saw that they didn't repent, not only that, but they went from really bad to worse, deceivers and deceived, as Paul says. This was uh, Nadia Bulls Weber. We saw that she mocked um, the purity rings, namely uh, where young girls will promise with their fathers to wait until marriage. Of course, there is forgiveness for these things, okay? If you've sinned in these ways, there is grace. But she's promoting actively sex outside of marriage. And she uh, mocked those who promote purity before marriage and even melted down their purity rings into something abominable and presented it to Gloria Steinem. There's Gloria Steinem there, the feminist lady. Um, okay, so this was um, also at an ELCA church. We looked at that just briefly. Remember that pastor even dressed up in drag to do a children's message. Are we living in the last days, friends? Yes. The takeaway, again, is what happens when you depart from the truth, when you start questioning it and saying it's not God's word? Well... All hell breaks loose, if you could use that phrase, or let's say you, you, you open up the floodgates of disorder and every vile practice, as it would be taught in Scripture. And, of course, this is the present-day um, bishop out there in the Northwest Synod of the ELCA Lutheran Church, who I think is a guy who wants to be a girl. It could be a girl. Yeah, it is, because it took the name Megan. So it's a guy who has a sex change and actually wants to be addressed as they. I am introducing to you our bishop, they. Bishop they is here. Let's give they applause. It doesn't even make grammatical sense, but that's where they've gone these days. Now, of course, we love all people. Amen? Everybody's welcome to come here and hear the word of God and be saved. But we can't promote everything. We've got to denounce sin. That's what the scriptures teach. If we, were, if we are to be Christians and to be found faithful at the day of Christ's return. Okay? Then we looked how the Church of England, even they have just this year gone that same route with respect to especially promoting uh, homosexuality in their church. We looked at this guy, uh, English, Englishman, um, Calvin Robinson, remember? And he was standing up at that great debate in Cambridge. We watched him. And he was stating the faith of the Church of England for the last thousands of years. I mean, back until the beginning of the Church of England. But he was ridiculed, attacked, and he was canceled. He was kicked out of the Church of England for simply confessing that marriage is between one man and one woman. And we saw the great courage of our brothers and sisters in the other churches. We celebrate our unity with them who are standing up for the truth of God. But as in the culture, as also in the church, the cancel culture as at large, uh, attacking those who will speak for God's word. And he spoke it in love, okay? But he spoke the truth and they cast him out. We looked at Pope Francis as well, how he also um, was promoting homosexuality and, uh, and the, uh, saying, that, um, saying it's not a sin and it's, they're welcome uh, in the church. Of course, they're welcome in our church to come and hear the word, of course not to receive the sacrament, but to hear the word and be, believe and be saved. We want everybody saved. We have no judgment on anybody that way. We want all people to be saved, but we are not going to promote false and uh, sinful lifestyles. 
we saw how he does, unfortunately, and on a number of occasions. In fact, we've confessed as the Lutheran Church since the 500s, the great takeaway there is he is the chief wolf in, in, uh, in sheep's clothing that we need to be on guard against. The one who's been promoting the New World Order, uh, actually, to the United Nations from the 1950s and on. And he's promoting all kinds of things in the church today that we reject. Most especially, in the 1500s, the Pope uh, anathematized or eternally cursed anybody who believes the true gospel that we profess that we're justified by faith alone in Christ. They condemned that at the Council of Trent. So be on guard against that. We need to be discerning. When I meet people in our own church and other places that they're like, I love the Pope, he's such a nice guy. Well, on the surface, yes. On the surface, he's very nice and kind and gentle sounding, and he has a beautiful accent with that Italian. But that's not what we judge by, the outer shell. We judge by, are you faithful to the word or not, including the Pope. Martin Luther said, if the Pope preaches the truth, we'll bear him on our shoulders and parade him through the streets. But if not, we are, then we are obliged to reject him. And in fact, he's condemned the gospel, unfortunately. Then we looked at, uh, what about conservative biblical churches? I mean, we, we need to be careful, obviously, about churches that are having theys as bishop. Uh, that's easy kind of to discern, or drag queen pastors. What about uh, preachers we hear on the radio, conservative Christian radio, biblical preachers that hold this Bible to be the inerrant and infallible word? Can we trust everything they say? Well, we still are called in all things to be Sherlock Holmes, to test everything. Just like I'd say to you, test me on everything and make sure I'm telling you the straight, clear preaching of the word. If anything, you have a question, ask me about it. Let's open it up and we'll read it right there and see if it's the truth. We looked at, remember R.C. Sproul? I love R.C. Sproul usually on the radio. Do you listen to him? Uh, Ligonier Ministries? I find him to be super educated. Um, he has a real great understanding of history. He speaks so well of Luther and describes him very well a lot of times. A lot of his teachings really right on the money, really good. And yet we looked at something to be discerning about and to watch out for about him. What was that? Well, he was asked in this interview about, um, uh, does God desire all men to be saved? That's a straight question, isn't it? What did we note about him? It took him five minutes to answer it, and he gave him the run gave the runaround, because he's a Calvinist, a Reformed teacher from the Reformed churches. What does that mean? He was a follower of John Calvin, and Calvin taught double predestination. God only wanted ever to save a few couple of people, several people. The rest he created only to be damned in the eternal fires, to be fuel for his wrath, to put on display his power. For all eternity, that's the only reason he created them. He never wanted them saved. They never had a chance to be saved. So when asked, does God desire all men to be saved? He knew that that was going to sound bad. So he just kind of said, well, there's all different meanings to end. This word can kind of mean that and this. And, 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 blah, blah, blah. and by the end, he never answered the question. Or if he did, he answered it in the, uh, no, God doesn't want everybody saved. But he didn't answer a straight answer to a straight question. My point there, a takeaway that I think we should all have is your preacher or whoever you're listening to should give a straight answer to a straight question. It shouldn't be hard. Does God desire all men to be saved, Pastor Greg? Yes. Done. Prove it. 1 Timothy chapter 2. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, says Paul. I can quote you the scripture. It's clear as day. Beware if you have a preacher as great as he is, and I love, really enjoy him, he's now passed away, but uh, who will take a word like God desires all men to be saved and then say, well, all doesn't really mean all. And God so loved the world. Well, world doesn't really mean world. You know, and, and they have to take plain open statements of scripture and say that can't possibly mean what it's plainly saying. I have to reinterpret it with my theology to make it fit. So that's Reformed theology. It's called, uh, ours is called universal grace, namely, that we believe God desires to save all people. Theirs is called particular grace. God only ever wanted to save a few, so beware of that doctrine. Um, and that is a divine mystery, but God desires all men to be saved. God so loved the world, John 3, 16. 
1 Peter, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all reach repentance. Ezekiel, I have no pleasure, says the Lord, in the death of anyone, so turn and live. Isaiah 49, I think, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, says God. These are plain, open statements of Scripture. So enjoy him, listen to him if you want to, but be discerning. Be Sherlock Holmes. Don't smoke a pipe, not good for you. But other than that, just be discerning. Be uh, watchful about these guys. I mean, here's another guy I really like a lot of times for certain reasons. John MacArthur of Grace to You Ministries. Is that what it is? Yeah. Grace to You. What do I like about this guy? I really like that he is bold and courageous. He's not afraid to call out sin or sinners. He even calls out false preachers from the pulpit by name, Joel Osteen and other people, which is not popular, but he's doing it uh, to keep his church safe. I like that. He teaches right on a lot of doctrines, but we noticed on some things he doesn't. We need to be careful about him as well. He's a Reformed Calvinist Baptist, similar to R.C. Sproul. Did Jesus die for all? Did he die on that cross for everybody? His answer was no. That's wrong, okay? Christ died for everybody, says the scriptures. Not everybody's going to be saved. You need to come to faith in Christ to be saved. But he's going to say, no, Christ didn't die for them. He, his blood was not shed for them. That's a wrong teaching. That's something to be rejected. We saw him also on baptism. Remember that? When he looked at Peter's letter, where it says, baptism now saves you, says Peter. Right? That's this open statement of scripture. He said, well, baptism there can't possibly mean baptism. It must mean our experience of coming to faith in Jesus Christ way apart from any water baptism. It's something spiritualized in the heavenly places. And I'm like, that's just not what it's saying, though. The scripture says baptism now saves you. And we have other baptismal scriptures where God is working through baptism to bring Christ to us. Faith still not must believe it to be saved. We're justified only by faith in Christ. But notice again, um, he's, he's taking scriptures, and we also looked at his teachings on the rapture, the uh, end times teachings, and saw how those also, unfortunately, were an error. And I showed why those are an error um, through open, clear teachings of scripture. It, it boggles my mind that he can be that great in so many ways, and yet, how do you mess those, those up so obviously. One I didn't show you on that one was he looked at Genesis 6 and his teaching is that when it says the sons of God came into the, into the children of, into the daughters of men, he believes those were angels, demons that came down and had sex with physical women to create a, a race of half-breeds, half-demons, half-men called the, uh, the Nephilim of old. Uh, the great men of the earth, you know, and, uh, and, he, and I wanted to show that to you, but for the sake of time, I didn't, where he says, sons of God in the Bible is a phrase that it's, it's all over the Bible, can only mean angels. And I thought, hmm, as I listened to that personally, and I thought, let's type into my, comp into my computer here, sons of God. How many times does it occur in the Bible? Like 11 times. That's it. And of those, uh, only three refers to angels. The, all the others, all eight, other eight refers to human beings, the righteous, the line of the righteous, which is my view of that. Um, you know, it's a good dis discussion sometime, Genesis 6, what's the right view? But just notice there, when a preacher will tell you, the Bible's very clear in this. The whole Bible says such and such. Make them prove it to you. Say, let's look through those passages and see if that's the truth. Don't just take his word for it, okay? Test everything. Be a good Sherlock Holmes. So if you want to listen to him, I find him sometimes helpful and encouraging. I like, but be discerning. Hold fast what's good. Abstain from every form of evil. Charles Stanley, what were we supposed to watch out for with him? Well, similar things, but remember we watched on him teaching, once saved, always saved. In other words, it's impossible to ever fall. Once you've become a Christian, you can live like the devil in unbelief, more or less. Go after all kinds of vile sins and still be saved. And uh, we can reject that. That's not what the scriptures teach. It's possible 
we see, to depart from Christ. So we need to be diligent to keep to him, hold fast our faith in him, and not depart and, like we saw there, fall off the edge of the cliff. Um, he's going to teach you, even if you close your eyes and it's pitch black and, and you're walking wherever, you're not even paying attention to your feet, don't worry, you once came to the altar and made a confession, a decision for Christ, you can't ever fall. Uh, that's not what the scripture says. So we need to be on guard against that kind of teaching. The rest of his teaching, I've been super encouraged by. Um, he's really comforted me. A lot of times in Maine where I was kind of feeling anxious with the Lord and concerned over my salvation and I heard a sermon from him, I remember, in a parking lot once uh, up there in Maine and I just sat there and listened to him for 20 minutes and I was very comforted. So I'm not saying everything he says is bad, but just be on guard against some of the teachings that come out there. We looked at Tony Evans, one of my favorites. I really enjoy his preaching. I mean, I know you don't because he yells, right? You didn't like his yelling. I kind of liked his yelling because it found sound passionate. And he is like the master of illustrations. His illustrations, like, it's like someone takes a cattle prod and brands them on my brain. It's so good. I mean, I remember his illustrations like for 30 years. I've heard <laughs> the illustration from 30 years ago. Yet, he teaches some false doctrines as well, including carnal Christianity. Remember? That's similar to where we saw there with the once saved, always saved, that you can be, he says, you can basically uh, have been a Christian, turn and become a murderer and kill your own mother and still be saved. Because it's impossible to fall. You can be a live in total sin and debauchery, and you're still saved. That's a false teaching, once again. If we continue to sin deliberately, Hebrews 10, deliberately, continuing, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries, says Hebrews 10. So, listen to him if you want to. I enjoy him. His illustrations are unbelievably encouraging. Powerful preacher, but be careful on some of those doctrines, like this, the, that little song. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Right? For the Father up above is looking down with love. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Joel Osteen, famous, he's called America's preacher. We looked at him and we watched some of his stuff, and a lot of people just totally rail against him, and I do believe he's a false prophet, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And yet, at the same time, um, some of the things I've listened to with him have been not all wrong. Um, and some of his, he's a great speaker. He's the smiley guy. He's always smiling. He's a winsome kind of friendly guy. Um, he gives good illustrations, too. Um, and some of his words are encouraging and not bad. Although, he is a false teacher. He's a wolf because he not only uh, teaches uh, the health and wealth prosperity gospel, which is false, word of faith teaching, which is false, but also his sermons never talk about Jesus or condemn sin or warn of hell and the wrath of God or call people to repentance and faith alone in Jesus Christ. If you want some motivational te teachings about how Thanksgiving can make your life a happier life, he might give you something good. But don't go to him, I would say, as a preacher for your soul, to get you to heaven, he'll lead you astray. And here on Larry King, we saw him deny that uh, um, about Jesus being the only way to heaven, basically. And he's saying that Mormons can be saved by being Mormons. Th this one we did just as a quick aside, Oprah Winfrey, because um, we saw how, uh, even though she's not a preacher, but she's one of the biggest church leaders, the church of Oprah, basically. And we saw how a, a woman stood up and one of her classes and said, Jesus is the only way, Oprah. And Oprah was like, no, 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 no. So beware of her too. Um, be super aware of her. In fact, she's been, a lot of people are saying she's part of the whole Maui, Maui uh, destruction, purposeful destruction of La, Lahaina, La, 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 Lahaina and uh, power grabs and land grabs and New World Order. So don't go anywhere near her. So the other, the other people you can listen to a little bit, don't listen to her at all. David Jeremiah, he's on the, all, all the time on the radio. We looked at him as the rapture, uh, the teaching of the end times left behind series, remember? 
and uh, we need to be on guard against him. Now, he's conservative. He gives some good sermons that you can hear some good stuff in. Um, if you like it, I, I, he's not my favorite, but uh, I would listen to R.C. Sproul before him, but that's just my own personal preference. It's neither here nor there. But, but his teaching at the end times, remember he said, for example, all the early church fathers believed in premillennialism, as I'm teaching it, with the rapture. When you looked it up in reality, zero of the early church fathers believed his version of the end times. There were some premillennialists in the early church, yes, but his version with the rapture, the left behind, and all this stuff, nobody believed that until the whole John Nelson Darby, the 1800s, and then the 1900s, the, the Timothy LaHaye, uh, great leak, great planet Earth, and it be, it's become very popular. We looked at Kirk Cameron and the Left Behind series. Remember that, the tribulation? I like Kirk Cameron. I think he's a sincere, very sincere, zealous, bold, courageous Christian. He wants, uh, that is, he's, he's trying to do the right thing, but he's bought into the whole left behind teaching too, and he's now promoted movies for millions of dollars teaching false doctrines of the end times. A book where, boy, there, there are great warnings against misteaching that book, if you recall, at the end of the book. And he even teaches that the two prophets of Revelation 11 actually have literal fire breathing out of their mouths instead of just the word of God is like a fire. So you got to beware against that one. That's a false teaching. The left behind teaching is going to damage your faith if you believe it. And if you try to evangelize with it, you're going to look like a, a nut job to, to the unbelievers um, thinking that's what you believe. We looked at Jonathan Kahn for a couple weeks, actually. He's the mystery guy. If you want to think of Jonathan Kahn, think the word mystery. He loves the word mystery. He teaches, he has a message on the mystery of Barbie, the movie that came out. And look at this, here are some other examples. The, myst the revealing the moon bride mystery. The mystery in the basement. The mystery of the Parthenos. The mystery of the spirits. The mystery of the Shemitah. The mystery for Joe Biden. And those are just selections. He has everything he talks about. He always uses the word mystery. So I think of him as, I don't want to be too degrading, but I always think, just the word that comes to mind, or the picture is Scooby-Doo. The mystery van, you know, when they drive that Shaggy and Scooby, Scooby Snacks. Uh, he's always trying to reveal a mystery. That's his, that's just my kind of mnemonic go-to. Um, not to pick on him that way, but uh, that's just what the image that comes to mind. Because he's always claiming to reveal a mystery to you. We looked, we took a whole week and looked at my Bible, or no, sorry, my book review of The Harbinger which he wrote of, of his whatever, how many books he's written now, which um, he teaches that Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10, basically is being fulfilled. Isaiah was, in a secondary way, speaking of the attack on America of the Twin Towers. Okay, you weren't, weren't here for that week? Anyway, um, that's raining, what do you know? Uh, my take on Jonathan Kahn is simply this, that he has some interesting parallels. If he were simply to say, I see a parallel between Isaiah 9 and 9-11, and, and I would have zero problem with that, okay? I do parallels all the time. If he wants to say, as he says in other places, you know, uh, what are, Hillary Clinton is like Jezebel and Donald Trump is like Jehu. I'm okay with him saying, I see a parallel here. Or as the new book he has out, The Return of the Gods. If he wants to say, I see a parallel between ancient demon worship and modern demonic in influence in our society, I have zero problem with that, because I see similar stuff. But when he starts saying, I am a prophet, I am the chosen one, and Isaiah 9 is predicting and fulfilling uh, not Isaiah 9 verse 10 that I have a problem with because that's not what Isaiah is talking about and remember I showed how I, we didn't get into 9-11 but if indeed it wasn't the Muslims but the deep state that attacked us which I could show if you want to look at that at some point then you would have to throw the entire book in the trash as a prophecy because the whole parallel is built upon the fact that the Arabs 
The Assyrians attacked us in fulfillment of Isaiah 9, verse 10. If that's not true, that it was actually a deep state operation, that's debatable, of course, and I haven't shared that with you, but my view is it's a deep state. If that's true, then the whole book falls on its head at that point, out of prophecy. So if you want to read his books or see his interviews and say, I'm just going to see what parallels he sees and if that's interesting. I found some of his talks quite interesting. And he says, this is, the, this is what the Ishtar worship was like in the old days, and look what they're doing today in June on her month. I'm like, okay, that's cool. If they want to say, um, if he wants to say, oh, look how their Baal worship and sacrifice of children was, or Moloch, was like the abortion of today, I'm like, okay, I see that. As horrific as that is, I'm okay with, if you want to give me some research, parallels, that's okay. That's what all preachers do. But if you want to say that I know and I'm revealing to you through a special chosen message prophecy that these, this scripture is being fulfilled here or that way, you, man, you better prove it at that point because you've now brought yourself up into a, from the, what is it, the farm, farm teams? You're in the major leagues if you declare yourself a prophet and that you are now going to say Isaiah is fulfilling 9-11. Uh, well, then you better prove it. You've put a huge onus, a burden on you to prove it. I'm skipping through some of the things we did here, but then just for the sake of time, I'm going to cover most of them. We looked at three weeks we've done discernment and music. music. And I want to share with you so much this movie that I've shared with uh, this talk with Lynn I shared with her. But I just don't, I want to get on to Daniel. Uh, so I could have shared that with you tonight. It's about 45 minutes long. If anybody's interested in watching a special, wonderful evangelical talk, it's not the best quality video, but his content is really good on church music and I got a lot of my ideas from him. Let me know and I'll send you the video and you can watch it at home. But he's f absolutely fantastic. He shows how rhythm and melody and everything and how he believes it should go in the church. So do we need to be discerning in music? We need to be super discerning, almost as discerning as with the Bible, not actually, but pretty close because Martin Luther said, Music is to be praised as second only to the word of God because by her all the emotions are swayed. That is why there are so many songs and, and, songs and psalms. This precious gift has been bestowed on men alone to remind them that they are created to praise and magnify the Lord. Music can change and redirect the course of your days. It's a powerful blessing and tool for your good and to the praise of the Lord and the uplifting of your spirit. But be careful, not all music will do that. Much of it today, even in the church, but even especially outside the church, will lead you astray from the Lord, promote uh, fleshy types of things, lead you from the path of Christ, and destroy, as it's destroyed entire generations recently. Where, where's everybody in the church? Well, I think they've largely been led out of the church by the music of rebellion. A lot of the music is rebellion. We saw in that thing, you can't praise God with all types of music. Certain types of music are for praising God, and if you use the same words and put it to a different beat, you're no longer praising the Lord. All right. And uh, not that we're always only singing, you know, it's not like Pastor Greg, you know, walks down the street chewing gum, singing a mighty fortress is our God all the time. I mean, I, I listen to other music. <laughs> I like, to, I like to listen to movie soundtracks when I'm doing sermons. Like, I like to listen to Dances with the Wolves or Robin Hood. It's very peaceful and it, lifts, and it lifts me up to kind of noble thoughts of God. I just watch it, what it's doing to my spirit. And uh, I'm not all perfect with that either because sometimes I listen to some music. I'm like, are the angels enjoying this one, Greg? Or are they bashfully hiding their faces? You know, when I listen to some lighter rock or something like that, I'm like, eh, maybe I should turn that one off, you know? So uh, I'm not going to be a legalist, and, and I'm not going to be poking my head around the corner at you, but I'm just saying, just be careful, okay, because music is super powerful. What's God say about music in the Bible? We'll just do briefly. David, remember, he, he plays the harp, and he drives away the evil spirit from King Saul. Evil spirits can't stand godly music. If you use... If you're having harassment at home and you feel tormented by an evil spirit, 
maybe put on some good, old, good praise music of some good kind, like we've talked about here, they might, be, they might just run out of the house. They can't even stand to be in the presence of that kind of praise. Just like I can't stand to be in the presence of certain music that other people love, certain harder rock music and stuff that just, I cannot stand it, grates against my soul like a chalkboard scratch. Uh, we looked at how Je uh, Jehoshaphat, remember, um, he just sent the praisers ahead of his army. And they didn't even have to fight anybody. God destroyed their enemies for them, and they just licked up the spoil. We saw how Elisha, um, when he was going to prophesy, called for a harp. And, and when the harp was played, the Spirit came upon him, and he prophesied. We see how Moses sang on the other side of the uh, Red Sea, remember? Uh, a song of triumph to the Lord. We're told to praise God with all of our heart and with symbols and loud sounding symbols in the Psalms. We're told to sing to the Lord with all of our hearts, uh, with thankfulness in our hearts to God, giving thanks in Jesus Christ. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We saw how there's music in the church that even in the ancient times was unholy, or let's say ungodly worship in this case with Nadab and Abihu. There was ungodly music, remember, uh, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and there, were, there was dancing. It's not the sound of war, it's the sound of singing, I hear, says Moses. They came down and broke the tablets. He was so angry that they had forsaken the Lord. It was ungodly, their worship, and their music was going right along with it. So music and the Word of God need to be partners. At least when you're listening to earthly, worldly music, let it be the kind that is still lifting your soul to God helping you on the path of Christ. You know, some of the earthly music I listen to from soundtracks, I still feel is uplifting me to to want to serve the Lord with a, a peace and a boldness. The value of a militant rhythm music. Remember, that was my main theme and the main theme from the guy that we watched, uh, if you want to see that video. Um, that does not mean that every song is, is an aggressive song. It means that the rhythm is that way. You can sing very peaceful, quiet, prayerful songs, chief of sinners though I be. That's still the militant rhythm of one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Not the rock and roll, which is uh, 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 accents two and four. That's a uh, sexual thing in dance music. Val the value of militant rhythm music. Remember we watched if you're going to fight a war like this one, remember the two armies were singing. These guys had their song. They had their song to counter it. We need the right song because we're in a real battle. We've got to win. It's the Lord who's going to give us the victory, but we still need the right song to fight. We need to be like, you know, conquering King Arthur, after your namesake there, and have the right music for the battle. We looked at rock and roll. We looked at the history of it. Even the artists who confessed where the history of rock and roll came from, remember? Um, Bob Dylan even confessed all of his songs came from his pact he made with the commander in unseen places, as he said, of this world and the place that's unseen. We watched that video. And so he said the words that he had in his songs were magically written from some spirit that gave them to him. And you read the words, that ain't the Holy Spirit, that's not the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's, the, that's the evil one, obviously. And we saw that same with other bands that have made similar confessions. That the, you know, the beat of a lot of these things that we like um, or get us dancing and stuff. Some of those beats, they have the origins in African voodoo uh, where the summoning of spirits. So be careful. Little ears what you hear. Um, the Christian music changes in the church, earth church and the rock and roll we saw came especially, well, down through the Methodist and the Holiness churches and then Calvary Chapel and the Jesus Freak Movement. Jesus Movement, Jesus Freak Movement, and then you had Christian rock bands. Remember, we went from the military march to the dance music. That's the, the, the difference in the rhythm. And, and these were some of these points up here. I didn't cover them all the other week. But um, I'll just put them up here for your perusal at some point, or a picture if you want to look at them later. Went from military march to the dancing music. Notice is the music, that, this is the, 
Not that you can't have dance music, but the music that we have as the church, congregation, singing here for our triumph and our march to, to, to Zion, to victory, um, are, is the music in the march type of rhythm or is it the dancing swaying of the hips type of movement? Uh, I'll just jump down to this one. Um, is it Jesus as your king, as most all, if you listen to that, almost, almost all of our hymns, are referring to God's royalty as kingship, our service to our great king who loves us and gave his life for us. Is he our king or is he our romantic lover? A lot of the modern music, again, I'm not going to poo-poo all of it, but a lot of it, if you listen to it, is for a romantic lover. If you don't hear the word Jesus or Lord somewhere in that song, uh, you could just as easily think that that's about your one night stand, a lot of these songs. I was just listening today, um, thinking about these things and the message tonight. I'm like, okay, I'm going to turn on the Christian radio see what I hear. And the first song I heard was, This is the Air I Breathe, the one we listened to last week. And I'm thinking, well, song, I kind of like the song, but I'm like, that could just be about a lover. How do I even know it's about Jesus, except that they throw the word Lord in there at some point. Uh, notice, by the way, if it's king, what are our songs that have king in them usually about? Uh, I proclaim or uh, we praise you, we acknowledge you, we serve you, we lay down our life for you, we uh, fight for you, we take up our cross for you, uh, you do these things for us, etc. What are the songs now about? It's like, I desire you, I long for you, I feel for you, I cry for you, I want you. And see, there's the difference between the king and the lover there as well. Again, I'm not going to be a Mr. Legalist and say that there can't be one thing or another at times, but as the general study diet, I kind of looked, at, I love this picture for this purpose. This is kind of, to me, the old hymns. These are the new hymns. You know, the old hymns is looking in the distance, resolve to fight and win the war and protect the lady and all these things. This one's kind of like more desire, pretty, softer. And maybe both are good, but I... As a steady diet, I want to at least give you that which is going to most help get you to heaven. The source upstream of what you drink. Think about this for every music, whether you're listening to worldly music or, or uh, Christ Christian music or church music. Who is writing this hymn? Who is singing this song? Who conceived it? What is the fruit in their life? Okay, What's upstream of what you're experiencing and drinking here. Remember Amy Grant, we even looked at her, this video. What are you doing, Amy? Come on. I mean, she's wearing a red dress, which is occultic, with hexagrams, casting hexes. I mean, like, come on, Amy, what are you doing? Too bad. I liked her. But even so, Michael W. Smith, you got to just wonder, guy, why are you writing your name backwards, buddy? What Christian does that? Writes the name backwards. That's Luciferian. Hillsong, I'm getting towards the end here. We didn't cover all these things, but Hillsong, well, that's the picture of modern Christian worship from that band, which is maybe the most popular, almost, one of them. Uh, their band from Australia, all over. What is the picture there? Rock and roll concert, right? Notice again, uh, jumping down here, the service has gone from being in the light to being in the darkness, from having a clear and sober mind to altered states of consciousness from worshiping forward to the altar to backward to the back of the room as the music is thrown at you. Masculine to feminine, fortitude to dreamy. Um, the origin for the, the hymns that we sing here, I think, are clear where they're coming from, the writers. The modern ones, I'll at least say, let's just say to be fair, suspect. You have to test each one. And the reason I'm saying suspect there, we, well, we want to win the war and not be iffy about winning the war because this is a real fight we're in. Um, is this, I mean, this is the same woman, the worship leader. I mean, you look her up on the, on the Google images. I'm like, should our worship leaders be doing that? I mean, she's obviously wearing some clothes, more than a lot of women these days. But still, what's going on? That's, is that the worship leader that we're looking for? And then, of course, we looked at that one. This is another one of their singers, Brooke Lingerwood. Is that the way you should be portraying yourself? if you are trying to lead men's hearts to Jesus Christ. 
You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be a the racial pro, not racial, but a profiler here. But I'm like, if I see that as my worship leader, I'm not thinking as much and as well about Jesus. If that's the way you're going to pray, Trey. Not to say she can't lead in a worship of a song, but not like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Christian women should be, and men, should be helping in whatever way they can to help people's hearts to be soaring up to heaven, not having some earthly temptations. Okay. I do want to say that Hillsong, if you want to know the root and the fruit of the reservoir where it's coming from, well, this is one of the Hillsong pastors who had an affair with this lady, a Muslim. They break up there. Um, and there's a lot of that in the church. Um, you can go to Hillsong College, College too, like Diego Samilia. If you want, to, want God to call you into the ministry, start a modeling career. Hillsong will notice you, as like they did me. Here's their Hillsong youth pastor and dance as he dances as the naked cowboy in front of thousands of women. So that's the actual church, okay? They have multiple churches. Should a church, is this what Jesus died for is my question. If you're going to drink water, remember, from something you wonder what's upstream, we'll look upstream. Is this the fruit that you want to be putting into you? Is that the, the group? The this same guy also dressed as the Hillsong Naked Santa, and notice, scantily clad, sexual. It's like, that's not the kind of thing Jesus died for, okay? And that's, therefore, why I'm concerned about Hillsong music. That's why I'm concerned about a lot of the modern stuff that's going on. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to say it's all wrong, but I'm just going to say, you've got to be high, high alert there, high alert. Oh yeah, definitely, uh, definitely. Here's the Hillsong's version of Silent Light. It was like Madonna, remember that? I'm a material girl, remember that one? That's their Christmas service, Silent Night. Scantily clad Madonna type of thing. And here's song, I showed this to Art after the service last week, we didn't have time. Hillsong's basic Hindu ritual in a Christmas service. They did the, 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 one of the gods of the thousand arms. All these, by the way, are in the shape Beware of, see, a satanic shape. And that, that's the, I don't even want to do it with my own hand. But that's the satanic shape as well as the 666 shape. You'll see that all over if you research that kind of thing on the internet. But church services have turned into that, at least at Hillsong. That's one of their services. Is that what Jesus on the cross, bleeding and dying, crying out to his father, died for, for his worship? I don't think that that looks good. Ray Comfort, you guys listen to him on, right, on, uh, on uh, Saturday mornings. He said he, he was originally part of Hillsong in the early days and uh, was part of the evangelistic stuff and liked it. But his confession, I can show you the video if you want, he said his conclusion was 90% of Hillsong attenders of that church are not born again. That's, that was his conclusion. You can watch the video as to why. He says basically they're not preaching the law and the gospel. They're just giving something that is flavorful, entertaining, and makes you feel Christian, but they're not giving you the truth. And so watch his video on that if you want to. I'm almost at the very end here. Why do I choose then personally to be very careful with that one, if not go that way and go this way? Because I did try to worship with some of that music years ago, but I just didn't feel right. I'm like something, I can't put my finger on it. The word Hosanna, there's no problem with the word Hosanna. The music, I'm like, it's pretty music, but something is hitting my spirit wrong. I can't put my finger on it. But because I'm iffy about it and concerned, I'm like, let's just back off and not even use it, Greg, at least for me. Okay, you can make your own decisions. But I just figure if, if I'm not sure, let's just, let, me, let me go with what I'm sure about. That I can lift up my heart. And uh, that's just what I want to give you is the music that's, bright and sober-minded and you know not to say we all follow the best music okay we can write music we can get better music in these ways we do our best we're a small church but i just want to give you what you can use to win because remember we are in a fight the good fight of the faith and we need to conquer jesus says revelation 3 who conquers shall sit down with me on my throne and and uh 
And we are to come to victory, like Paul says. I mean, I know that this looks like a Greg picture. I always love knights and stuff. But you know what? This is very biblical. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel of peace for your feet. I mean, a knight, a warrior, a fight, that's the scriptures. That's not Pastor Greg. That's serving a king. That's from the Bible. That's, this is the reality of the what we're living in, and we want to get to the prize of Christ and the kingdom, and I think we need good music to get us there, okay? Music that's going to inspire you and lift you up towards the final kingdom. Are we at the end here? Final slide here is be confident then in your faith. Uh, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. I don't want to be a, I'm picking on this or I'm picking on that, but we are called to be discerning. We are called to be careful, to Test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And true preachers have to call out wrong teachings in order to help everybody be safe and walk along that, you know, really good path. Woohoo! We hear at the very beginning. Da 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 da. If this is our journey, let's just be attentive to the path of our feet so that we walk, you know, that all your ways may be sure. And, uh, and we attain to our prize at the end. Okay, if you want to get anything more on that other video on the music, if you'd like that, write your name down. I'll send it to you. It's awesome. He does a really great job. And next week, we'll put this away for now. We can pick up on other stuff some other week. If you have some other people that you want me to look at sometime with you, I'm happy to do it. Um, we've seen enough of it for now, I think. But we'll move on to the book of Daniel next week. So we'll get back to regular Bible study verse by verse next week. And that'll be a great book, a fantastic adventure. Great word for us in our modern time for encouragement too. In Jesus' name, amen.